Watch this show live on Facebook or download the podcast at energeticcity.ca. Welcome back to Moose Talks. I'm Dub Craig. Now we're going to chat with a man who spent uh, a long time living in an airport and has since made his way to Canada. He's got quite the story to tell uh, even since coming to Canada. Uh, we're very happy to be joined by him now. It's Histan Kantar, the activist and author of Man at the Airport, How Social Media Saved My Life, One Syrian Story. Hassan, welcome to Moose Talks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very grateful you took a few minutes to chat with us uh, okay. this morning. Um, we only have 10 minutes, sadly, uh, so we'll do our best with this. But uh, as I said, you've got quite a remarkable story to tell about your experience living in an airport in Malaysia uh, for seven months. Uh, that you recount in your book how did you come to live in those circumstances what happened it's it's the Syrian story since 2011 when the Syrian war took place uh, that's the story of millions of Syrians around mm -hmm. the, the world and uh, I'm just one of them uh, simply I ran out of option I have been judged uh, because of my nationality not because of uh, uh, crimes that I committed mm -hmm. uh, not only in Malaysia unfortunately even the Arabic uh, world uh, countries like uh, United Arab Emirates uh, so uh, they detained me uh, and uh, they sent me to immigration jails in different countries and I end up in Canada. So it's a new type, if you allowed me to say, a new type of racism we as Syrians are facing since 2011. Um, unwelcome war. Mm -hmm. That's uh, as simple as that. So um, no one wanted me. Mm -hmm. I found myself at the airport. Yeah, and you were there for, I believe, seven months, I counted. You Followed were. by two months in detention jail, yes. So yeah. in total, nine months. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I think uh, comparisons have been made. There was a movie, uh, Tom Hanks, I think, The, the Terminal. Terminal Tom Hanks, um, yeah. I mean, this was basically your life. You lived completely in the airport you had to stay in you know kind of certain parts of it how, how did you survive with a little different than the movie the Terminal. and i yeah. always joked about it i said he had catherine zeta jones and i have no one <laughs> but bring, bring me catherine and i will wait uh, for as long as she wants fair so <laughs> i was totally alone so it's not fair to compare between the movie and i but mm -hmm. uh, uh in day-to-day -day basis it's almost the same uh, small things you never thought that it's going to be a problem it becomes become a major problem mm -hmm. in your life where to ha uh, to take a shower how to take a shower when to take a shower how to dry your clothes where to sleep when to sleep mm -hmm. uh, even a cup of coffee will be a problem mm -hmm. and uh, or a meal uh, so uh, with time if you did not panic if you calm yourself down if you breathe and if you start seeing hope uh, then you will overcome this problem and you will start finding the keys for them mm -hmm. uh, the major problem was how to get myself out of the airport yeah. because it was was a, a unusual uh, situation. Mm -hmm. The struggle I was facing with the world was the question, it's not what I'm doing at the airport, it's why I am at the airport, mm -hmm. it's, uh, so I can get out of it. Uh, I survived because uh, I uh, start seeing life or understanding life from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we all hear that phrase that giving up is not an option. Yeah. Uh, that's great, I cannot agree more. But if it's not an option, what is it? It mm -hmm. should be something, it cannot be nothing. From what I understand, it's a result. It's a result for us not believing in what we are doing, not uh, uh, be in love with what we are doing. For us, looking for an instant results when life doesn't work that way. We need mm -hmm. to be patient. Uh, we need to fight back. And uh, when I understood that, I said, uh, um, if I'm going down, I'm not going down without a fight. I'm telling my story. And that's when I uh, went to social media and start posting. Um, and when individuals Canadians and other people from all around the world start uh, um, reaching out to me and praying for me. I start my um, faith in humanity restored and I start seeing hope at the end of the tunnel. So uh, I fought back. Wonderful. Canada was... Was this your goal in mind kind of for a long period of time or was it, was it kind of the first thing that worked out for you that okay Canada you're welcome to come to Canada you know and I may be mm. over generalizing mm. it but mm. but when when you were in the midst of the situation in the airport were you like maybe Canada is an option this is where I need to go 
or did it just kind of work out that way? No, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. Canada is uh, for us as refugees. We don't have the privilege of choose uh, sure. what country. But okay. if we do, if we do, no one will choose any other country over Canada. Canada has a different place in all our minds and heart and souls. I could not even dare to dream about Canada, even when I was at the airport. It was not there on my radar, and okay. uh, uh, because I knew that it's uh, way above my limit, and I don't meet all the requirements. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the Canadian people start hearing the story from the news and from the media, they reached out to me. And there is a fact, uh, and that will should tell us something about Canada. I have been on uh, on the news all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, even in languages I did not recognize, and uh, uh, even local uh, radio stations in U.S. or Australia. And uh, the only lawyer who reached out to me and said, I'm going to represent you for free uh, was Canadian. The only group of volunteers uh, who reached out to me were Canadians. Uh, and that's when Canada started being on the, the map. They discovered that it's easier for me uh, to come to Canada. And that took another seven months, nine months. Uh, but um, it's uh, I still can't believe it sometimes because it's a dream come true. And uh, for us as adults, we don't have fairy tales. It's for children. We have goals we mm -hmm. need to achieve. But no, for adults, uh, I'm, I'm living my fairy tale still. Wow. And here I am, two and a half years uh, in, in uh, Fort St. John and... Uh, this is the farthest north uh, so far, uh, just in two and a half years, trying to pay back to the community who, who gave me the opportunity to be here. So yeah. um, I, I, I am still um, living the dream and um, m each and every minute I'm, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Wonderful. Yeah. I have to ask you, uh, because as you mentioned, two and a half years you've been here. I, I believe you started in Whist Whistler was kind of where sure. your first job, where you first landed. How did you end up uh, in Fort St. John? What brings you here? The lady who sponsored me mm -hmm. and who led the volunteer groups, Lori Cooper, she's now in Smither, another uh, t town in the north. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she was living on Whistler at that time. I and see. I had an offer job when I was at the airport. I applied for a job in Whistler uh, at a hotel and uh, they did an interview interview and I got accepted. So I, I had a, an offer and I had a place to stay uh, at the staff accommodation there. So I ended up in Western and that was not a bad <laughs> place to be. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could not leave. And now I, uh, the fact is Whistler will be always my first Canadian home and no one can take that from me. Mm -hmm. I skied for the first time. Yeah. And um, uh, it will show you how life is weird and un, un, unfair and injustice, but it's generous as well. If you were patient enough, it will give you back. And it gave me back Canada and Whistler. Okay. So what, why are you here in Fort Saint? You're working for the Red Cross, I True. understand. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, we are here to help uh, the community with the vaccination. Okay. I'm going to stay for another two months. Uh, I drove from Vancouver to, uh, to, to up to here. Oh, and it's a beautiful drive. Amazing hey? drive. Amazing. <laughs> and wonderful. I saw uh, a moose for the first time in my life. I, you had said you wanted to visit an indigenous community. Mm. And it was kind of on your list of things you definitely want to do. Why is that, out of curiosity? I feel a uh, similarity and a special connection for, with them. Um, and it, it's, it's weird. We are the newest comers to this land, uh, refugees, and they are, the, uh, they are here since thousands of years. Yeah. They are the original uh, owners. Um, but, uh, and I cannot start, uh, dare to start comparing our tragedy with theirs. But sure. uh, uh, we also uh, suffered from losing the ones we love. Mm -hmm. and uh, never be able to say goodbye. We've been disconnected from our roots. We have been kicked out from our land. And no matter what joy and success we are going to have in our new home, Canada, we will always miss our original home and uh, 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 all the memories we had. Uh, they, had uh, they have been through a lot of trauma and uh, uh, we did as well. And mm -hmm. we are still living on it. So I know how they feel. Uh, with all the unmarked graves we are having and uh, um, the reconciliations uh, we are looking for, the action and justice, um, I know what they are talking about. I, I can feel them. And, um, and 
it, it makes me feel sad what they went through because uh, I have been there. I, uh, in 2016, I was in detention jail in United Arab Emirates when I heard that my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And the, oh, oh, through the night, I could hear uh, the fireworks and see the lights of it while I was sitting alone in my cell looking at the phone without being able to reach out to the phone because of the iron bars. And yeah. uh, all what I wanted is to call my family. I know what it means to be in your darkest and lowest moment in life and uh, that's why um, I want to meet them uh, for us in the Middle East and this is maybe a new information for you we don't know them as indigenous and that's the amount of work we need to do uh, even globally not only domestically uh, we know them and that's I knew that it's a racism when I arrived to Canada we call them red Indians mm -hmm. The whole world, because of the effect of Hollywood, mm -hmm. the whole Middle East knows them by Red Indians. And when I came to Canada, I knew that this is wrong. We should not call them that. And I start educating myself. And that's my mission also now as a refugee, to educate my people back home and in that part of the world, that uh, th what these people went through. And it will also show uh, Canada with the human rights we are having now with all, because other countries, they went through a lot in their histories, but they are not speaking out about it. And that's, we are facing our, uh, our past. And that's a good thing in Canada. If we want to move on to reconciliate, then uh, we need to, to face it. And it's going to be painful. It's going to be hard, but it's the right thing to do because we are living the present. That's right. But we are also writing tomorrow's history history and we are doing a good job so far wonderful Hassan, this has been a wonderful conversation i wish we had more time but thank you very thank much you for very coming much in for to chat with me. me today i appreciate it my pleasure thank you for having me it's Hassan kantar the author and activist uh, a man at the airport how social media saved my life one syrian story it's well worth picking up and checking out